According as every man purposes in his heart, so let him give. That's 2 Corinthians 9, 7. I call it the escape clause. For obvious reasons, it is the antithesis of systematic 10 to 28 percent mandatory tithing. But notice what the passage says. Let each one do just as he has purposed in his heart, not grudgingly or under compulsion. The tithe, whether you gave it grudgingly or not, you still had to give it. And you were under compulsion to do it because if you didn't, God would curse you with a curse. And that is quite a compulsion. And then, of course, God loves a hilarious giver. So Paul was writing quite the antithesis of Old Covenant Mosaic tithing. Now, every tithing message I've ever heard from any tithing advocate in any pulpit anywhere eventually gets around to Malachi chapter 3. As I read it, it's going to sound very familiar because this really is the, the location that they all want to go to in order to advocate people to give their 10%. And this is the place where the curse is mentioned, but it is also the place where there is a promise made that God will open up the windows of heaven. So oftentimes that becomes the motivation. Don't you want God to rebuke the devourer for you? Don't you want God to open up the windows of heaven? He says, test me in this, so bring all your tithes into the church, well, the storehouse, and when you do that, God is going to pour out a blessing you're not able to contain. And so that becomes the inspiration for tithing. But let's look closely at the context, because the context is plainly and precisely and specifically to Israel under the law. Here's what it says. Starting in Malachi chapter 3, verse 7. From the days of your fathers you have turned aside from my statutes and not kept them. Return to me and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. Does God ever speak to the church that way? The very same church that Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Do you ever hear God begging his church, please return to me and then I'll return to you? Well, that's the context of Malachi's speech to Israel. Anyway, the people will respond and say, how shall we return? And God says, will a man rob God? Yet you are robbing me. But you say, how have we robbed you? In tithes and offerings. You are cursed with a curse, for you are robbing me, the whole nation of you. Now, very seldom does the tithing advocate include that last phrase, the whole nation of you, because as soon as you hear that phrase, you understand that the people being addressed in this passage are the Israelites, the folks who are under the law, the ones who are being taxed in order to support the Levites. They are the people who are required to tithe. And so their lack of tenths is in fact robbing from God because it was God's intention to make sure that in the economy of Israel, the poor, the widowless, the poor, the widows, the fatherless would have something to eat and that the Levites would be supported. So going on in verse 10, it reads, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse so that there may be food in my house. Far too often the tithing advocate reads the phrase, in my house, and says, that's the church. And so bring all your tithes into the church. Of course, there's no New Testament writer who says anything even remotely similar to that. The church is never called the storehouse of Israel. And the storehouse was a very real physical presence within national Israel. There were specific places set up where food was collected in order to be distributed to the poor in Israel. And it wasn't the New Covenant New Testament church. Nevertheless, so that there is food in my house, come and test me now in this, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you a blessing until it overflows. And that's where the preaching starts. Don't you want God to give you a blessing that you can't contain? Don't you want the blessings of God overflowing in your life? Well, all you have to do then is bring all the tithes into the storehouse, the church, and once you've brought those in, God is going to open the windows of heaven. In other words, 
your giving to get. And if you give those tenths, then God is obligated to open the windows of heaven to you. Problem is, God's not addressing the church. Because the next part says, Then I will rebuke the devourer for you, so that it may not destroy the fruits of your ground, nor will your vine in your field cast its grapes, says the Lord of hosts, and all nations will call you blessed. For you shall be a delightful land, says the Lord of hosts. This is all about the land. This is about the land of Canaan once it belonged to the nation of Israel. This is about God making sure that they had plenty of grain and plenty of fruit. In other words, plenty of food. So make sure that you bring the tenths of the blessing God has brought you and bring that food to the storehouse so that the poor would have something to eat. That's the context. But let's look again at verse 9. Because in verse 9 it says, Because you've robbed me in these tithes and offerings, you are cursed with a curse. How exactly do you preach to the blood-bought New Covenant Church? The ones who the writer of Hebrews says are perfected forever by the single sacrifice of Christ. That he perfected forever those that he sanctified, those that he set apart for his own personal use. How do you say to those same perfected forever people who are under the covering of the atoning work of Christ, the same people who have gained the benefit of righteousness and justification being imputed to them because their sins were imputed to Christ and he bore the wrath of God in our place. How do you say to those same people, but if you don't give enough money, God will curse you? I thought Christ took our curse. After all, when he fulfilled the law in our place, he fulfilled the curse that went with the law. The curse is removed from us because Christ, as our substitute, absorbed the curse. So how exactly does the tithing advocate read that text, the most common, most popular text that is used to inspire people to bring all their tenths to the church? How do they read that with a straight face and not see the theological conundrum that they've created by saying to a church of blood-bought, redeemed people, bring your tenths or you will be cursed with a curse because you're robbing God. Again, back to the escape clause. Paul said to the church, nothing about robbing, nothing about you are under a curse, nothing about storehouse. Instead, he said, every man according as he purposes in his heart, so let him give. I'm going to go with Paul on that one. Now, there are only a couple of places in the New Testament where the concept of tithes is even discussed. One of them is in Hebrews chapter 7. It's in a conversation about Abraham coming in contact with the priest of Salem, the king of Salem, the king of peace, a man by the name of Melchizedek. Starting in chapter 7, verse 1, we read, For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham as he was returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him, to whom also Abraham apportioned a tenth part of all the spoils. He was first of all, by the translation of his name, king of righteousness, and then also king of Salem, which is king of peace. Without father, without mother, without genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like the Son of God, he abides a priest perpetually. Now observe how great this man was, to whom Abraham, the patriarch, gave a tenth of the choicest spoils. And those indeed of the sons of Levi, who receive the priest's office, have commandment in the law to collect a tenth from the people, that is, from their brethren, although these are descendants from Abraham. But the one whose genealogy is not traced from them this is Melchizedek, collected a tenth from Abraham and blessed the one who had the promises. 
but without dispute, the lesser is blessed by the greater. And in this case, in the case of the Levites, mortal men receive tithes. But in that case, the case of Melchizedek, one receives them of whom it is witnessed that he lives on. And so to speak, through Abraham, even Levi, who received tithes, paid tithes, for he was still in the loins of his father when Melchizedek met him. Now, that's the discussion on tithing, and you'll notice that it is completely consistent with everything we've learned so far about tithing. It's all about Israel, it's all in the Old Testament, and it's all about the Levitical priesthood being supported. Now, it's a reality in the book of Genesis that when Abraham met up with Melchizedek, he did pay him tithes, he paid him tenths. As a consequence, I've heard many preachers and tithing advocates argue that since Abraham paid tithes, that means that tithing predates the law. And so, guys like me who come along and say that tithing is just a Moses thing, it's a Sinai covenant thing, it's an exclusive to Israel and the Levites thing, they say, no, no, tithing predates the law. And since it predates the law, it wasn't done away with when the law was done away with. And so they make tithing an exclusive element that is in the law, but before the law, and therefore it wasn't abolished with the law. You see the thinking. The problem is, if you're going to use Abraham as your example of tithing, especially pre-law tithing, and you say that you're going to follow the example of Abraham, what did Abraham actually do? He went out to war with his own private army. He slaughtered some kings and came back with treasure. And when he met Melchizedek, he gave Melchizedek a tenth of the treasures he had taken from the spoiled kings. And that's the only time we read of Abraham tithing. And he didn't give away 10% of anything that was his. He gave away a tenth of the spoils. We just read it. So if you're going to say that we need to follow an Abrahamic version of tithing, because after all, it predates the law, then every Christian needs to give one tithe one time, because that's what Abraham did. And they, may, and they need to make sure that the one tithe that they give is a tenth of a spoil that they've acquired by routing some kings and their armies. Now remember for a moment that Abraham was very wealthy. He did have his own standing army after all. It's a very wealthy guy, and yet he did not tithe a single portion of anything that belonged to him. So Abrahamic tithing would be, you don't give anything that's a tenth of anything you own, but if you ever go out and rout anybody and take their stuff, you tithe a tenth of that. And if you've done it once, you have satisfied the Abrahamic requirement. That would be consistent Abrahamic tithing.